Hi and welcome to the Machine Ethics Podcast. This is the podcast that discusses the impact of AI and autonomous systems on society. This month I'm talking to Miranda Mowbray of Bristol University. We talk about detecting cyber attacks using machine learning, big data ethical code of conduct, sitting down with your team to discuss ethical issues, trying not to collect data when you don't need it, or in fact deleting data, and in computer science education adding a computer science and society or ethics component. If you'd like to find out more about the podcast, go to machine-ethics.net. You can support us at patreon.com forward slash machine ethics. Thanks very much for listening and hope you enjoy. So, hi Miranda. Hello. Thanks uh, for coming in. Um, Could you just introduce yourself briefly and uh, where you come from? I'm Miranda Mowbray. Uh, I spent most of my career in industry doing industrial research, um, mainly in cyber security. And uh, a year ago, I joined the University of Bristol. Um, I've worked uh, on the ethics side. I worked on ethical codes of practice Mm -hmm. for big data use. (laughs) Uh, But I've always been interested in the the questions from cybersecurity of the interaction between technology and society. So this definitely comes through. Um, And uh, one thing I did was used machine learning in order to catch attacks on computer networks that have never been caught before. Great. Um, How I got into codes of practice... Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, we were collecting huge amounts of data in order to analyse uh, what was happening in networks, I, s- I saw what it was possible to deduce from that data. It completely scared me. Um, and I uh, revised our own project's code of practice, and then people asked, started asking me about um, helping them do the same for their own projects. So I worked on um, quite a few initiatives about that. Yep. And um, are those the sorts of code of conducts? I'm, I'm interested in if they're kind of, um, are they quite stringent? Are they uh, practically minded or are they more sort of guidelines, uh, philosophical, directional lists? Or no. is it something much more hardline than that? Uh, I, I would say they're as practically minded as possible. Right. Develop mine in order to get the project so I administered it myself so I had lots of interest in making it as practical and as easy as possible and I do think that um, people who work in this area Mm -hmm. they want to do the right thing you just want to make it easy for them yeah and easy to recover when something goes wrong. So it was very much a practical approach. However, when I was working with organisations that where we were talking uh, about guidelines for a large organisation, maybe a large multinational organisation mm-hmm. that had lots of different laws and lots of different projects going on, mm-hmm. we had to keep it enough with enough flexibility so that it could be implemented in ways that made sense at the local level. But right. yes, that the whole thing was to have practical guidelines yeah. to make sure that you're doing the right thing. Yeah, and that was doing the right thing with a lot of data. Yes. Yeah. So um, we're talking about 100 terabytes of data or it's not big data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And those, those, are they spanning kind of user interaction, like some things which are obviously personal data or is it things which inf- can infer things about people um, by their interactions or their usage, that sort of thing? Um, or just I'm- like a whole gamut here, like... Uh, whole gamut, but yeah. uh, if you can infer something mm-hmm. about a personal uh, data about a named person, then under yep. EU definitions, it is personal data. Right. Great. Yeah. Yep. And one of the really interesting research, philosophical, ethical questions mm-hmm. is the fact that we can infer many more things from um, more tangential data than we thought was possible before. Mm -hmm. So we had uh, certain protections just because it wasn't possible to deduce anything about you from your gate or the fact that you like curly fries. Oh, do you know about the curly fries paper? Uh, I do like curly fries, though. So. Uh, okay, so um, this is uh, this is one of the, the papers by the psychiatrists um, whose work led into Cambridge Analytica. Right, yeah. Uh, and they looked at uh, various things about Facebook likes and saw what, what they could deduce about your psychology. Uh-huh. And one of the strongest links was people who like curly fries were intelligent. So congratulations. <laughs> um, it's to do with it's to do with um, associative behaviour. It's it's because the right. the woman who put up the uh, like curly fries page was at um, an American university that you can't get into without a high IQ. So most people uh, who clicked on it were her friends. But the okay. point is that yes. even though there's there's no um, direct causal link, yeah, no, no causal link, so, you can yeah. still assume it. And this, yeah, yeah. sorry, um, <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. But in that case, what you're, what you're actually saying is. 
people associated with that person are yes. intelligent, not necessarily curly fries. Make you intelligent. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And in fact, maybe now it doesn't show anything because lots of people have read this and thought, oh, if I like mm. curly fries, that will make me intelligent. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so has, it's kind of like this, it's almost like this echo chamber sort of thing, which it doesn't echo, it changes. I mean, we yeah. will change. That's and right. if you have these algorithms which are not changing, then obviously you have a, an issue, right? Yes. In this remit. Yeah, I have to keep on retraining. Yeah. Yeah, retraining. Yeah. Um, so let's go back a bit. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Before we go forward. Um, so I always ask this question to all my interviewees um, Can you, um, what is AI to you, or can you make mm-hmm. a definition of what AI is? Right. I'll, I'll say what I think and then I'll ask you what you think. Great. Um, I don't like using the term mm-hmm. because. I think it leads to the wrong impression about what's possible. It means that people are automatically using the analogy with human intelligence. Um, The kind of AI that I've used is machine learning, and I prefer to say machine learning. And that is um, uh, exactly as you said, adapting Mm -hmm. that the the algorithm is automatically updated as a result of its processing. Yeah, yeah. So as it's going through, it's updating um, what it produces as an output given an input, basically. Uh, yes, and yeah. it uh, so um, normal code. You give mm-hmm. me an output. Yep. Uh, it's processed by software. Mm-hmm. Sorry, give me an input. It's yep. processed yeah, yeah, by yeah. software. It produces an output. Yep. Machine learning. Yep. You get an input. It's processed by software, and this produces both an output and an update to the software or the weights that are in the software. Yes. So yes. the algorithm itself has some part that that adapts as a yes. result. Uh, but you can do that where you have maybe a f- uh, facial recognition software which you can say is it's good enough and then you can stop that learning and then just use it verbatim mm-hmm. or you can carry on learning so yes. it's kind of like two is, is there any other way of like doing that um you know is that yeah just... you can um you can learn in uh so you can have training data where you train it once and then reuse yep. it if you think that the situation will not change yeah yeah um uh. <laughs> so what do you, oh and i would say uh, machine, there's a lot of things that are described as AI that are not machine learning, so traditional AI yeah. uh, knowledge-based systems mm-hmm. where you're capturing human um, knowledge, yeah. uh, logic programming, that, that was described as AI as, as well. Yeah. There is a tendency to describe AI in a way that I don't think is very helpful, which is mm. anything that surprises us the computer can do yeah. because that is obviously self-limiting as soon as you, you have a good program that does it. Yes, yeah. It's no longer AI so in uh, a short time we will not be surprised that computers are good to go. We'll say of, of course they are. Well, of course, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think someone's mentioned that before that the uh, yardstick or, or you know, keeps moving, the goalpost yeah. keeps moving. That, that's why I like yeah. calling it machine learning where it's yeah. kind of clear. What yeah. about you? What do you think AI is? Um, I think AI is a slippery term like <laughs> you saying and um i don't think it's super useful um and it's but it's only useful when you don't necessarily have an affiliation with the other terms right. so for me i'm i'm very interested in genetic algorithms mm. oh yes and things like that and yeah. like more novel types of um producing stuff which might be more useful for artwork or more useful for right. exploring a space uh-huh. rather than learning specific skill yes. or going towards a specific output. So this is search algorithms, pruning techniques, that kind of thing? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So those, those things really interest me, but I wouldn't necessarily go to my, my parents, well I might go to my parents, I wouldn't go to my grandparents maybe and go, I'm really interested in genetic algorithms and they'd be like, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's difficult to then have to then explain exactly what I mean. So AI can be somewhat useful in that, but I try not to use it. Uh, right. Yeah. I think um, there's something that happens at the top of every hype cycle. So yeah. we're in the top of a hype cycle at the moment, which is mm-hmm. whatever it is that's being hyped, uh, everybody, what they're doing is that. Yes. And so the definitions become extraordinarily loose because everybody wants to claim it. Right, yeah. (laughs) And you just have to live with it and be precise about what you're... what what you are talking about. Yes. So so at the moment, so you do a lot of work in machine learning. Uh, Yeah. Yes. And and do you have a a specific tool set that you normally bring to Um, your work? I've I've used anomaly detection because uh, I do cybersecurity. And Uh, and that's unsupervised learning techniques? Uh, It's hard to get ground truth in cybersecurity. Right. But where you can, you want you want to use it. Yeah, so as okay. as supervised as possible. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you use unsupervised learning techniques yeah. to to show things of interest, and mm-hmm. then you show them to experts and say, 
is this really an attack? If so, what kind of attack? What's mm-hmm. going on? Yeah. So, if, and then you use that to retrain yeah. uh, in order to get the supervised. Aha, so that becomes part of the supervised set at that point. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Great. So if um, if, if people don't know um, the specifics of these, what we just talked about, unsupervised learning is a way of lo- kind of looking at the the data and making correlations. Let's say. Um, so uh, the analogy I like to mm-hmm. use is recipes. Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, machine learning yep. is like add salt to taste. That means try this recipe with lots of different types of salts. Yep. See what the outcome is, and work out the best amount of salts to add. Yeah. Okay. Um, unsupervised learning is here are lots of different things that have been cooked. Yep. Find one that's different from the others. You don't know what the recipe is. You don't know what you're looking for, but you find one that's unusual. Right. And yeah, that's, yeah. that's normally detection. Yeah, and that's presumably very useful in cybersecurity. Uh, because you don't have uh, much ground, ground truth, yeah. yes. Yeah. Uh, but also, uh, the idea is that the, um, the attackers will uh, continually change their strategy, or there'll be new mm-hmm. sets of uh, attackers with a different strategy. So you yeah. don't know, in general, what they're yeah. going to do, but you do know that it's probably going to look a bit weird, because right. um, most behavior is benign. Yeah. Um, the, the trouble is that just because something looks a bit weird doesn't mean it's an attack. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's. Uh, so you have to get a nice balance there. Like you have to. Well, yeah. so what you do is you try and look for things that are weird in a way that is consistent with a known attack methodology, rather than just right. things that look weird in general. Yep. Uh, I don't believe that that works, although some people believe it, it does. I've mm. actually tried on lots of data, and we find um, people who are Latvian or people who are <laughs> um, coming into the office at night you know yeah. it's something like that right okay cool um, and it, it does the, the I mean we were talking briefly about the code, code of conduct stuff does that yes. come into the cybersecurity world or is it more to do with the obviously the big data stuff it's the big data stuff yeah. although the reason why I started working on that was the work in cybersecurity because mm. of uh, because what we were doing was very data hungry um, I, w- I had access to all the web lookups of all the employees worldwide. Right. Um, and a couple you of thousand can, employees. Uh, more than that. Yeah, okay. Fine. Um, uh, and uh, you can imagine what you could discover from that. And yes. uh, I did this experiment that really spooked me where I asked for pseudonymized data. I'm really glad I pseudonymized it. Yeah. Where I couldn't tell who it was yeah. and worked out what I could deduce about about them and I found some very sensitive personal stuff and some very sensitive commercial stuff. Right. And I said, look, we have to have some sort of process where mm. we show that we, we're treating this data properly and respectfully. If there's any problem, it probably wasn't us. Right, OK, yeah. <laughs> so you're, you're almost um, putting together checks and balances so that if something does happen to do this data, it's extremely impl- implausible mm-hmm. um, because obviously you're not giving people this data anyway. Mm. Um, but it's not even like you will be doing certain things with the data. That's right. So yep. there'll be some things that we wouldn't do. Yep. Uh, and there are um, um, technical checks and protections that we would have. Mm-hmm. But I think if you wanted a number one suggestion from me, yep. it would be just sit down with your team before you start doing a project, yep. uh, thinking about how you're going to analyse the data and discuss what sort of ethical issues might come up. Come up. Yep. So have, have someone from outside of your team who can give a different pr- perspective. Yeah. Uh, and just talk about it, think about it. Yeah, and this is really practical. This is something that you can do as Absolutely. the data team or the, the, the development team or the cybersecurity team um, yeah. in most businesses. I mean, most yeah. businesses are IT solutions, don't they? Yeah, yeah. that's um, right. Great, done. Let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's not enough. I have a whole, whole uh, long list of okay, suggestions. Right. If you would like to see a good list of suggestions, there's, yep. there's one on which I was um, part of the advisory board and took part in the, um, uh, the pu- public consultations, mm-hmm. which were fascinating, yep. which is the ethical code of framework developed by the Home Office. Right. Um, for civil servants. It's very much about government data, but their recommendations are very concrete, clear, specific. Mm-hmm. Um, I would suggest that. And the first first one is start with a clear user need. So uh, mm-hmm. don't, don't um, do analysis on data just for fun. Do it yep. um, with respect for the people whose data it is and think about how they might benefit or society might benefit. Um, devil's advocate yes I've got um, a great thing that I because I do play with data sometimes mm-hmm. and, and, and so do on, I <laughs> just, um, with you know work on people's projects yeah. and 
I always think that data not collected is the most private data. You yes, know? absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, don't collect it in the first place. Exactly, yeah. So if, if um, I think that it came out of the kind of uh, startup Silicon Valley mm. mentality that you, the, the whole business plan was to um, get lots of people, get lots of data, and yeah. money will come. Um, and, and maybe. Yeah, so there's a great cartoon about that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so hopefully we are going to be moving to uh, be mindful of what you're doing with technology and, and um, create a business around whatever the business is and yes. not just verbatim steal people's. Well, not steal, let's say. Collect everything. Let's yeah. just not collect everything if you don't need everything. And and also, uh, sometimes you can't help but collect things. Mm-hmm. It's incidental. And so you have to think about throwing things away. Right. You have to think about data life. But all of this is the law, right? Yep. All of this is in uh, GDPR. So if we're doing this yep. in Europe, yep. you have to. You have to do it. And most and people connect to Europe somehow yep. through the internet. Yes. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Great. So, tell me about uh, the book that you're, you've written. Oh, I, it, this is not a book I've written. Uh, I uh, contributed mm-hmm. a chapter to a collection right. uh, on future law, okay. um, and that that one is about yeah. the. Um, it's it's coming up. I don't know. It's, it's been accepted for publication. You, you know right. how it is with books. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and that is about what exactly what I've been talking about. Uh, it's the um, the guidelines for the code of practice. Yeah. And, and what's the what's the title of that book? Is that to be defined still? Um, Both future law. And, oh, it's future yeah, law. sorry. And the rest of the book is about different parts of. Yeah, it's yeah. it's mainly written by lawyers, uh, yeah. and it's about um, uh, future technology law and um, yeah. implications of technology for, for for future laws. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'll check that out when, whenever that is. <laughs> yeah. I think we'll we'll put a link to it when it comes out. Okay. Cool. On Thank the you. site. Yeah. yeah. Um, great. Um, and you're also doing a few talks. Um, yeah. So I have another uh, another law related talk mm-hmm. coming up um, in the Bristol Law Conference. And this is uh, I sent them two abstracts, and one was more sensible, and one's a bit more science fiction. Yep. And they chose the one that's a bit more science fiction. Nice. Uh, this is uh, comes from the uh, e personhood idea that came out of Europe. Um, it probably won't actually make it into law, but they were suggesting that um, robots that were sufficiently advanced yep. might be given e-personhood, that's the right to sue and be sued, and right. also be held legally responsible for carrying out some things. As, as individuals and not as... As, as themselves, yes. not as humans. Exactly, yeah. Um, and I think that's a really terrible idea. But it's, it's not even as... Because obviously we have this notion of... Um, Companies as yeah, that's some right. sort of individual. Absolutely, thing. I, I have no problem yeah. with um, um, inanimate objects being you persons if yeah. it's useful. Right. So my argument is this is not useful. This is not useful. So in what way isn't this useful? So the go. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason I think is if we start uh, taking some of the definitions used of consciousness, which is the the, the kind of test they're thinking of, right, um, and we uh, automatically grant some re- legal rights and responsibility. Mm-hmm. to anything, any um, piece of software that satisfies those. Yep. The main beneficiary of this may be malware authors um, because it will be rather easy to fake mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the definitions of consciousness with things that are definitely not conscious, uh, right. well, as far as I know. Well, I mean, yeah. it's impossible to right. tell, but sure. um, it seems very unlikely. Um, uh, and so we will end up mainly giving rights mm. and respons- uh, allowing malware authors to escape responsibilities or business owners to escape tax, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, for example, um, uh, the ability to do logical reasoning, well, mm-hmm. code does that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The ability to access your own state as data, so self-reflection. Um, anything mm. with a management console does that. Yeah, you can I reason about so, your yeah. own state. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's, there's plenty of code that does that. There's plenty of malware that does that. Yeah. There's oh, there's a fantastic um, piece of ransomware that has um, a console for the victim. Right. I don't know whether you've seen this. It's called Spora, um, and it uh, it it uh, tells you the 
the, the times that you've paid to protect yourself against malware in that family before and uh, how long you have to pay. And it actually gives you um, a chat window where you can talk to a human what? in case you have problems. Yeah, it's fabulous. Oh my God. Yeah. So it's, ran- it's ransomware yes. that has this whole kind of shopping cart with yeah. the chat thing. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, if you talk about the Turing test, the, mm-hmm. the test of passing as a human online, well, that is mainly passed, uh, although um, there's increasing business use of this. Yeah. It's, it's mainly passed by, by malware that's trying to convince you. Of, yeah. of uh, departing yeah. with your money or, yeah, that's or right. yeah, yeah. your information. Your yeah. information or yeah. um, uh, um, um, romance attacks yeah. quite often begin that way. Right, right. So, um, yeah. Uh, if you talk about the, um, I don't know, what, what other mm. tests would you like? I mean, do, do you think there was, what was the prerogative in them putting this together? Uh, was there some sort of catalyst? Because it's, it, as, a, as a person who hasn't actually heard about it personally, mm. it sounds like the only reason you would do this is given that we're not, what I was saying before um, we started recording, that we're probably not there yet. Mm with needing this stuff mm-hmm. so are they bringing together do you think to tax only to to be able to tax things i think you're absolutely right i uh, think yeah. they would like to tax robots yes exactly they think robots will put people out of jobs and they would like to to get some tax uh, that will replace the employment tax yeah yeah uh, i think that there are, i think that that idea is a not a good way to do it yeah. Um, firstly, because it's too easy to game. Any definition of robot, uh, or a dem- any definition, what is one robot? What is one robot rather than 15? Yeah, and, and can be they all have different uh, capabilities. Yeah, that's and, right. Yeah. And it's not the sensible way to do it. What you should do is tax mm. profits. Just done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything more to say? Um, uh, but, but I think that this whole thing is, is interesting in that it shows the difficulty of defining mm-hmm. artificial intelligence in the, in the science fiction meaning rather than machine learning yeah. um, uh, in a way that, um, that uh, wh- which doesn't capture a lot of things that are clearly not what you meant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's only going to become more important, right? Yeah. That we have a really good working definition of what these different things are so that the general public and... I mean, most people in employment mm. who maybe some algorithm is useful for a certain job, they don't necessarily know what that algorithm is or like what it does, and I think, they should feel about that. You know, there's, yeah. There's, I think there's there's a, a serious lack of understanding um, mm. amongst. Uh, it's getting better mm-hmm. amongst policymakers and certainly amongst yeah. the general public who get it from science fiction. Yes, uh, predominantly, yeah. yeah. Uh, and quite often the science fiction isn't actually talking about that. They're talking about something else. If you look at uh, Blade Runner, yes. it's, about, it's about, yeah, I love it too, yes, yeah. it's about animal rights. Yeah, it's nothing to it's do with robots. It's clearly about animal rights. It's nothing to do with robots. Yeah, we agree. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm really pleased <laughs> that you said that um, because I feel, um, I, I do like Blade Runner, but I feel... Um, Shortchanged because it's it's nothing to do with androids and robots yeah. and how we should feel about androids and robots and how they work. It's really about you know it's interesting slavery it's, and and, yeah. and you know rights of others, other people, essentially. I think some of the more uh, science fiction, the robot rights thing. Yeah. I think that's bad consciousness about say say uh, bad conscience about historical slavery. Yes. I think that's, yeah. that's where it comes from, yeah. and it's being applied to a field where it really isn't appropriate yeah. because we've made use of these metaphors that don't really work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and it's distracting from. Uh, ethical issues about AI that are right now and really matter. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so things like accountability, transparency, mm-hmm. privacy, trustworthiness, yep. fairness. Fairness, yep. yep. And you have an example? I uh, yep. uh, Pick one of them and I'll tell you. <laughs> um, so you did mention the Compass um, oh, example right, earlier, yeah. which is uh, one which I'm aware of. I'm sure some people will be aware of. But did you want to talk about that briefly? Oh, I can. I can. Yeah. I can talk about that more than briefly. Because I know about how what went down, but not necessarily the repercussions of that. Actually, right. um, if you didn't mind. Yeah. Compass is software that's used in several states in the United States yep. for recidivism prediction. This is uh, if there's a convicted criminal. Yep. It's known they've been convicted. Uh, this software. Uh, predicts whether or not they're likely to re-offend as uh, 
advice to judges and mm -hmm. other people in the mm -hmm. justice um, to on how what sort of sentence they need. Do they need to be locked up or not? In, yeah. in particular, um, and there was a big scandal about this because uh, it was found that black convicted criminals were being labelled as high risk of reoffence more than white convicted criminals. Yeah. Uh, and Compass uh, replied to this with a, a very interesting thing, which was they were required to fulfil a different criterion, which uh -huh. was uh, if if there was a black um, someone labelled high risk who was black and someone who was labelled high risk as white, they would have the same probability of reoffending. So that's a different condition. Okay. And yeah. it turns out that if you have a different underlying rate of recidivism, these two conditions are incompatible. You cannot fulfill them both. Uh, it, it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and so you have to, and there are other um, fairness conditions that are also mutually incompatible. Yeah. There are also things like uh, minimizing false positives and minimizing false negatives, which yeah. everybody knows are incompatible, but, yeah. I, I, well, I would like to say everybody knows, but I have been asked to, to do both. Um, so this is an example of where policymakers need to know what mm -hmm. is possible. Yeah. what is not possible, and make a policy decision about what kind of criteria that they set for yeah. these algorithms. I think Compass mm. is interesting in, in various other ways. It's not transparent. They don't say. They, uh, they, they say what the input is, the, the questions that are asked, and there mm -hmm. are some issues with that. Um, but they don't say how they go from the input to the output. Yeah. Because that's how they make their money, right? Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, I think a lack of transparency means a lack of accountability mm -hmm. and there's some very nice work by um, an academic called Cynthia Rudin who has looked at a, a completely open source way of making these decisions that gets better accuracy I mean I haven't heard of that mm. um, open source version but it smacks to me that maybe this is a domain which there's, there's never going to be enough transparency there's never going to be enough accountability people just don't want this technology in this place people are always going to have issue with it. Do you think it's just a misuse of technology? I don't. No, okay. Uh, I think what would be a misuse yep. is if the decisions were 100% relied on. But right. that is not the case. Yes. And uh, um, they are quite often overridden. Mm. Yes. And that's how it should be. Yeah. Um, and it's actually an interesting philosophical question. Mm -hmm. So yeah. uh, we know that the decisions on average are better than humans right. on predicting whether you're really less, pres presumably less no. biased by whether the you get things like whether the judge is hungry. Ah, uh, uh, well, you know, be careful. That that, I, that one on the Israeli. Of, no, the, the thing about whether the judge is hungry um, uh, that has been discredited. That, that particular okay, example. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, there's a, there's a different explanation, which is um, cases which are likely to be solved quickly tend to be solved first in the morning, and that's why. Uh, okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, it would be a lovely example if it was true. Yes. And yeah. maybe it's true, but but the the evidence hasn't it, been proven true. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, but, but yes, um, if you look, uh, on average, uh, uh, it's quite easy to produce a recidivism algorithm that's better than the average judge. Yes, and, and uh, in your opinion, that is a useful tool. Yes, yeah. uh, and, and, but yeah. I would still want yeah. there to be a human judge who could override this. Yeah. So the question is why? It's kind yeah. of interesting. Yeah. Um, do you feel the same? Uh, I think... Um, would you prefer to have accuracy and... No, I think it's just a misplacement of technology. I right. mean, my, my question was... Was a leading question in that way because right. I, th um, I think that this technology used in this way is perfect but they, they, they're using the output in the wrong way mm -hmm. the output should be why is it that these people from this postcode have been you know this certain group of people or whatever mm -hmm. why have they been marked as more high risk should right. we go into those communities and do something about that yeah I think that's the use of the technology that I want to see. Yeah, that would be nice. This is like a plaster over what's actually happening in Absolutely, the world. Absolutely, sure. And, um, and is done badly currently. So. And, and, of course, this kind of prediction can be used exactly in the way... Exactly, that, yeah, to actually so. make a, a, an impact in a useful, uh, humane, let's yes. say, way. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's my feeling about it. Because, um, yeah, like, it's, it's brilliant having this information. The information is not necessarily to blame here... 
maybe if it was more transparent and we could see where that was coming from and you know if we had this open source version and we got this output and we'd be like oh that's really interesting that it's saying this let's go and look at that and do something about it not um, send people to prison necessarily I, well you have to make a decision yep the decision is always going to be there. The yeah. decision is necessary. Yeah. And if you get it wrong one way, more people get locked up than need to be locked up. That's obviously bad. Yeah. If you get it the wrong, the other way, more people will be victims of crime, and that's obviously bad. Yes. So yeah. uh, increasing accuracy is clearly something you would like. And if yeah. you have a program that is more accurate, I think it would be wrong not to use it. Yes. Yes. But I would like a design which is... Uh, more open and accountable and yep. where um, the trade-offs uh, of policy of uh, what requirements you set on fairness are, are better understood yeah um, sounds great um, I still think that um, in my opinion it's one of those domains that it's just never going to be good enough really right. like people are always going to have issue with it no matter if it's perfect or not mm. people are going to be angry but I think um, as, a, as a more general point mm-hmm. I'd go up uh, bring up something you said before yeah I think I think there are two dangers Mm -hmm. when we see ethical issues with technology. One is to say, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the the danger is um, that bad things happen. Uh, But there is another danger, which is we're so so scared of bad things happening that we don't make use of the technologies and techniques that actually might be really positive socially. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to walk the tightrope between the two. Yeah. So with the ethics of big data, I think it's easy to say, uh, don't do these analyses at all. Mm. It's much better to think about how they could be used in a, in a positive way, to, um, exactly as mm. you were suggesting. In that yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So using the tools that we have, yes. leveraging this um, superpower, let's say, to look at a lot of data, make some predictions, mm. and do something with those predictions, which is hopefully helpful for society or yes. the domain that you're looking at without doing as much harm or that's right yeah 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 what do you teach your students do you teach them this Ah, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> i'm delighted you asked me that <laughs> so at the moment i'm teaching algorithms yep but one reason why i joined the university was um it's clear that the people who some people who will be very important in shaping how, what the world looks like will mm. be computer scientists. And it's undergraduates studying computer science now. Mm-hmm. And at the moment, our computer science degree is, is very focused on making the darn thing work yeah. um, and doesn't look very holistically about its effects on society and the effects of society on, on the code. And there's a new, completely new unit that is starting um, next spring, which mm-hmm. I will be giving some, some lectures on, which is about computer science in society. Great. Uh, and I think that's really exciting, really important to give undergraduates, uh, make them think of the sort of things that your podcast is thinking about. Yeah. And maybe, because they will be in the position of actually affecting. And, and, and hopefully introducing them to the podcast so they can get like... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, great. Yeah, I'll do you some publicity. And Thanks. the other thing is, um, uh, another thing that I'm intending to do next year mm-hmm. is a little bit more um, uh, grassroots act- activism, talking directly to policymakers or doing more direct analysis for policymakers rather than, bit, than sitting in an ivory tower somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you could, you could do a bit of both. <laughs> Um, so, and this is at Bristol University, right? I'm at Bristol University, yes. 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 Do you think there's this something that um, is going to be coming into other universities, this sort of computer uh, science plus, you know, the ethical component or social... Yeah, the, um, yeah. Uh, the British Computer Society, mm-hmm. uh, in order to, for them to um, uh, approve a computer science course, require an ethics component, which is good. Great. I think their design of the ethics component, I think we can improve on it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, uh, and uh, this, I'm sure you've noticed, this is, this is in the air. People yeah. have, have worked up to the, to the fact that there are all these fascinating but really important questions. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think there are um, long-term trends in particular with AI, which if we don't watch it will exacerbate inequality. Mm-hmm. Um, which will exacerbate the centralization of, of power and influence. And, and profit and uh, yeah yeah um, and this generation of computer scientists are the ones who might make it a more flourishing um, general ecosystem rather than everything being sucked up into a small number of places yeah have you have you um, I mean this is quite a harrowing picture isn't it if, if we go down that route is it, it have you heard of the 
technologist and writer Jaron Lanier, if you heard yeah, of this? Of course, yes. Because he talks a lot about the, the siren ser- the servers and yes. sucking into one place this yes. all this information <laughs> and and producing power, you know, influence and power over yeah. uh, the many in in one point. And it kind of contradicts what the vision for the internet used to absolutely. be. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. This um, yeah. decentralized uh, wonderland of free information and um, you know becoming of whoever you want to be and all this sort of stuff. Yep, stuff. absolutely. Yeah, it's unfortunate. <laughs> well, I, I think, um, I mean, networks tend to be more robust than um, anything with a single point of failure. Mm-hmm. So I'm an optimist. Yeah, so hopefully it'll just it'll get crushed under its own oh, weight. Oh, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> no. uh, yeah, it, there's a struggle that needs to be... Yeah, OK. So we're all in, we're in the good fight. Let's That's say. right, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, what happens if I make one of those servers and it's just so good? It's oh, so I'll come and argue with you. OK, great. Um, I have no plans to do that. So it's fine. <laughs> great. Do you have any... Um, I mean, we're getting towards the end now. Is it, OK. Is there anything that you want to leave our listeners with... Um, I would say, okay, you're listening to this podcast because you're interested in machine ethics. I would say you can probably find something that you can do, probably very small, Mm -hmm. but uh, something that you can do that works uh, in accordance with your values. Go and do it. Great. And if you're in a position, if you're an employee, and and you can ask those hard questions maybe of, you know, a boss or... Yeah, um, get together with your rest of your team. It's, it's yep. always easier if there are several of you. Mm-hmm. Um, assume that they will, um, that it will go positively. Yep. So don't get, be adversarial. Mm-hmm. Think about how this will help your company. Uh, it's, uh, I found that when having ethical arguments, you should always have a financial argument as well, mm-hmm. how this will um, make sure that your customers don't desert you. Yeah, yeah, if something uh, goes wrong or, yeah. or they find out about right. something you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the very last question, um, we've probably covered a little bit of the negative side of um, yes. how the future might look. What's something that's really exciting you about the future that you really want to see or, or some technology that's coming through at the moment? Oh, I think there are really exciting applications of AI um, in uh Healthcare. Lots of people have talked about that. Mm-hmm. Um, in transport and efficient use of energy, uh, climate science is, is incredibly compute in- intensive and data intensive. Uh, uh, shipping around, um, exchanging bits is better than exchanging atoms, uh, transport yeah. of atoms. Um, uh, I think that the the way that society is changing has some um, very positive potential as well as uh, potential for mayhem mm-hmm. yeah um so i'm i'm excited about developments in that area and yeah. every time i talk to undergraduates i'm really excited about what they will do which i can't possibly imagine nice great um so let's build the future together yes absolutely <laughs> <laughs> um so thank you very much miranda mm-hmm. um how can people contact you follow you all that sort of thing um uh uh, it's very easy to find my address because I work at a university. Yeah, so you can type it into Google. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. LinkedIn, great. Uh, thank you so much. We could talk for hours, um, but we will have to leave it there. Okay. And hopefully we'll have uh, another conversation another time. Lovely. Thanks. Yeah, I'd like that. Okay. Hi, it's me again at the end of the podcast. Thanks again to Miranda. We could have gone on and on and on. So thank you. It was super interesting. And a lot of the things resonated with me. I think, obviously, the educational piece was uh, really interesting. And just having those conversations, it was quite a uh, practical things that we could do right now. And um, I think that's what we really need. So get out and do that stuff. Um, I'd just like to apologise for the audio quality. Uh, We had quite a lot of people coming in and out and making noise in the background. I did a bit of editing on the audio, so um, I hope it's not too bad. Um, I'd just like to thank my Patreon supporters, uh, Cheryl Byford and Simon de Alfonso. So thank you for you two for contributing recently on patreon.com forward slash machine ethics. You can always get in touch with me at uh, machine-ethics.net or you can send me an email at hello at machine-ethics.net please do that I'm really interested in people feeding back to me about the podcast what themes you'd like to cover what questions you might have and what interesting other people I should be talking to so please let me know and thank you again for listening goodbye <laughs>